So part two today is about looking at Jesus, the complaint-free mystic, <laughs> and how he dealt with his process, his spiritual evolution, and his journey. You know, he was initiated, as we all are, right? We're all on that hero's journey that Joseph Campbell talked about that includes times of trials and tribulations. Anybody ever had a time of trial or tribulation in their life? Yeah, we all understand this, as we have had those times of great triumph and breakthrough, right? So that's part of the journey, uh, the spiritual journey as a human divine being. And so Jesus, of course, he was uh, baptized in the River Jordan by John the Baptist, and this was the beginning of that initiation. And then he was led by spirit out into the wilderness, into the desert, to fast for 40 days and 40 nights. And so during that time, he's fasting and he's praying and he's get being prepared for his ministry. And at the end of that 40 days, it says in the Bible that the devil came to tempt him. Now, the devil in unity is not a being. It's not, we don't believe in a place called hell or a being that's, you know, guarding the gates with pitchforks and, you know, fire and so on. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a fun story and it it's gives you the image, right? It's a great imagery, but we don't necessarily subscribe to the idea that there's actually a being called the devil and a place called hell. But... The, in unity, we look at the devil as the adversary, the adversarial mind. Okay, so it's that part of the personality or the mind, the ego, that can be kind of a trickster, you know, and can tempt us to get off our alignment, to get off the path. Wikipedia actually has a really nice definition for temptation. It says, temptation is the fundamental desire to engage in short-term urges for enjoyment that threaten our long-term goals. Yeah, so we all know what that's like, right? We're all very familiar, I'm sure, with temptation. And the times that we have given into it and the times that we have said no to it and how that has worked out for us, we know the journey, right? <laughs> so in Jesus' experience, imagine you've been fasting in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. Chances are you're feeling pretty weak in your body you're feeling really hungry, <laughs> and you're in that kind of state, right? And along comes the devil, or up comes the adversarial mind, right? And the first temptation that Jesus deals with is a temptation that I'm going to call consumption. It's the temptation to consume. It's the temptation that, that brings up for us a kind of grasping or craving that which we wish for. And in the scripture, it says that, that the tempter came and said, if you are the son of God, then just command these stones to turn to bread. You know, if you're, if you're who you, that you say you are or who they say you are, then just, you know, do the transformation thing that you're able to do. And Jesus replies, it's written you know, he's a good Jewish boy, and beyond a boy, he's a rabbi now. You know, he's becoming a rabbi. He's, he's coming into his own as a spiritual teacher, and he knows the scriptures really well. And so he says, it is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by the word that comes from the very mouth of God. And so he's saying, you know, I don't need your temptation. I'm not going to break this fast just because you're taunting me to show off. <laughs> That's not where I want to head. And so, so he's staying true to his long-term goal. He's staying true to his full initiation process. And how often for us along the way do we get some kind of craving or that kind of graspy energy, right? I need this thing outside of me. And sometimes it's for food or it's for, you know, whatever it is, whatever your thing is, you know what it is that you grasp for, you tend to long for. Not like in a heart desire kind of longing, but in that kind of uh, more, it's got that more kind of grabby energy to it. And so when we are in that place, that's that adversary coming up to, to kick us off our game, you know, to get us out of the alignment. And it's part of our initiation into the next steps of our spiritual journey as to how we might relate to that temptation that's being given to us in the moment. 
What will I do with that temptation? Will I give in to it? Will I cave to it? Or will I stay true to whatever commitments I've made to myself or what I believe will be for the highest and best good? So a lot of times it's staying true to something that has more of an ultimate place we want to go, more of a long-term goal, or more of a general commitment that we've made to our own evolution. You remember the band, The Temptations? You know, they sang things like, I'm going to make you love me. You know, a little graspy, right? <laughs> or, or this one real clear, Ain't Too Proud to Beg. You know that one? <laughs> so you know when you get in that kind of beggy space, right? You know when you're there. Sometimes we do it with people, you know? We want that person to be in relationship with, and we get in that sort of obsessive space around that person. Or maybe you remember that from long ago, your, your youth, that you've grown beyond, you know? <laughs> So, so these are the kinds of temptations we might deal with, the kind of things that might put us in a place of, of craving or grasping. And it's much like you know, the monkeys in India that um, have been given uh, a way to be recaptured and relocated. In 2001, there was a plague of monkeys in India, actually. I mean, and if you've ever been to India or some of these other places where monkeys run free, you get to experience their aggressiveness. I mean, they want your food and they want it now, you know? And this was happening in, in large numbers. The monkeys were getting to people's homes, stealing their food, they were biting people. So there were so many of them that the towns got together and said, look, we gotta, we gotta capture these monkeys and relocate them. This is getting really out of hand. So they did the traditional way of capture where they took their old um, emptied milk jars and they tied them to the ground. They put them out around their homes and they put in the jars a sweet, what they called a lolly. And so all these jars filled with lollies, the monkeys, of course, came no problem and got right into those jars and grabbed the lolly. The thing is, the monkey couldn't get its fist out of the jar if it was hanging on to the lolly. You know, so there they are, you know, keep getting stuck and repeating this motion, you know. If they would only let go of the lolly, they could slip their hand right back out of the jar. <laughs> And they were so obsessed with the lolly that the captors would come right up to them and they wouldn't let go. They'd still be holding the, the jar. And so it was very easy for them to relocate the monkeys. But don't we kind of become that way, you know? <laughs> What's your lolly? What's that thing that you just put your hand in the jar and you won't let go, you know? Literally, those monkeys were caught with their hand in the lolly jar, you know? <laughs> and so, so we too... <laughs> Uh, find ourselves, catch ourselves, and recognize for ourselves those temptations that we're caving into that, that aren't really working for us anymore. You know, it might also have been something that you would reach out to in the past that gave you comfort. And do you realize, do you ever have this experience where you go back to that old thing that you used to do for comfort and you realize it's got nothing for you anymore? You know, so sometimes that's your own test, right? To see how does that how, how am I doing with this? And you realize, don't need it. So that's kind of one of the ways that we're dealing with this temptation. Uh, there's other ways that this might show up for us, not just in kind of outer substance kinds of lollies or, or this sort of love, lust kind of energy that we can get with other people. It can be other ways where we have a need that sort of gets a little bit blown out of proportion. I had a, a staff member many years ago who had a, just a, a craving for appreciation and acknowledgement to the point that, you know, we couldn't keep up, you know? It was like, a, you know, I need a regular feeding of appreciation and acknowledgement. And, um, and it, it, it was beyond just the universal need we all have for appreciation and acknowledgement. And so we had many conversations about, you know, you got to find it inside. It has to be this sense of innate appreciation so that you can go about the world and do your thing without not having to have everything have some kind of validation of your worth and your, you know, some kind of approval. And so we may have those kinds of things. That may be your lolly, that you realize I have a really high need for whatever it is, and when I don't get it met, I get really upset. And so working with that a little bit. So it can be something where you make friends with, yeah, this is, of course, this is a need we all have. We all want a little bit of acknowledgement or whatever it is, 
And, and yet it can be more balanced because we find it within ourselves. And so that's one, another way that this temptation might show up for you. So any given number of needs that you may have and notice that you really come back to that thing that, that you're really needing quite a bit and, and see how you might get that met in a, in a healthy and balanced way. So it's also about just trusting, you know, trusting spirit that we have everything we need, that we have everything we need right here inside, right? And so we can always go to that. When we fill this well with our practices, we can always go to that full well and get what we need. Adyashanti is, is a local, he's actually a local teacher. Does, is anybody familiar with Adyashanti? Yes, yeah, some of you are. He was trained uh, um, in Zen, but he, in Zen Buddhism, but he's very, and he's become very universal in his teachings. He actually wrote a book about Jesus recently, and it's called Resurrecting Jesus, Embodying the Spirit of a Revolutionary Mystic. And he too talks about these temptations of Jesus and different things in his life, and how it mirrors our spiritual journey and our spiritual evolution. The way he sees this first temptation is that it's really about understanding um, that instinct for uh, survival, the fear that comes up around survival. And so he's, he's encouraging us to look at that a new way and to recognize, well, we all have been taught that you know, our greatest instinct is for survival. He says, maybe it's not. You know, that is an instinct we have. But maybe our greatest instinct is actually for love. Because if you think about it, there are numerous examples of people who give up their lives, right? So that someone else may live. You know, there's lots of stories of incredible things of people, you know, mothers beyond the strength of the normal human body lifting up cars to release children, you know? Or, or parents knocking the child out of the way of a car and taking a hit themselves. And not only for their own children, but even for other children. And it's soldiers and firefighters and police officers. You know, there's all kinds of heroic stories that are really about grounding in that instinct for love and protection, not so much survival for myself. Um, so, so there is that deeper instinct, and, and he's suggesting to us that what Jesus is facing in this temptation and what we all face is that overriding that, that knee-jerk kind of survival instinct and, and digging deeper to the instinct for love. And so to ask ourselves, you know, we can say, oh yeah, I would always choose love and connection over survival and fear, but it's easy to say when we're nice and calm and cool and collected in here and our bellies are full and, you know, <laughs> we're not in that kind of situation. But when we are in those situations, that's when that really gets tested. That's when the temptation can come forward. And the second temptation that happens to Jesus in the desert is really about hubris or specialness or even arrogance. In this one, the devil comes to him and he takes him to a holy city. So you know this is like a vision that's being had. And he goes to the top of the holy city, to the temple, to the pinnacle of the temple. And he says, you know, if you are who you say you are, if you are the son of God, you can, you know, just, just jump. Because you know the angels will minister unto you and they will lift you up. They won't let you dash your foot even upon a stone. And Jesus says, don't put the Lord God to the test. <laughs> Again, I won't be tested. I don't have to prove anything to you, you know? I don't have to show that I am able to do these things because those would all be a showing off kind of demonstration of the ego, and I don't need that. I know who I am. I know what I'm able to do. So it's that kind of quiet confidence, that sort of knowing of who we are. We don't have to prove it to anyone. And so you can think about that for yourself, those times when maybe you want to say something because you think you might sound smart. Or, you know, and you can just kind of check yourself and see, why am I saying that? You know, and maybe that's why I'm saying it, so maybe I won't say it. <laughs> you know, because you know it's that temptation of the ego to get that kind of approval or validation or to sort of show off of where you've, how far you've come. 
In this temptation, we can fall prey to the idea that we are special. And I know you've probably been told in unity you're special, but you're not. <laughs> it's the bad news. <laughs> Dang, right? <laughs> but you are important. That's the difference, right? Can you hear, hear the difference? Because special says I'm compared. Special says I'm separate. Important says, yeah, we're all important. We all share that. So there's not that kind of separation. There's not this idea that, oh, because I've read more books or because I've been on the journey longer or because I can levitate or I see phenomenon or I <laughs> have visions or, you know, I've had an out-of-body experience that I got this little edge on everyone, you know? <laughs> That's the temptation, though, isn't it? When you have an experience, I mean, it's, it is, it's tempting and it's, not just tempting to share it because it's a really amazing experience and you want to share it, that's one thing, but it's how we come off with that sharing and then how we begin to think about ourselves. So it's that, that game that the ego plays of, I'm going to puff myself up so you will be diminished and I will feel bigger, or I will diminish myself so you can feel big and puffed up, you know? That is one of the ego's favorite games, comparison. And as Roosevelt said, comparison is the thief of joy. And we want that joy that we spoke to, that was spoken of in our meditation. You know, as we, as we let go, we open to that joy. As we let go, as we open ourselves, as we empty ourselves of these temptations and say no to them, which is exactly what Jesus is teaching us. There was a student um, that Adyashanti tells the story, and I've heard it before too, uh, this, this student who had been working with a Zen teacher and he went, as they often do, to have an interview with his teacher. And his teacher said, how's it going? And he said, well, actually in my day-to-day -day life, not so good. You know, my spiritual life has been great. I've had these big shifts and I feel really great about that. But my, you know, my family life, not so good. He says, my wife says, you know, I'm not really paying attention to her. And my children say, I don't spend enough time with them. And he said, well, do you? And he said, well, no, not really. Because I just want to be you know, in this, this great spiritual space and in relationship with you know, God. And you know, probably didn't use that term. But anyway, he, you get the idea. <laughs> and the, the teacher says, well, come to this retreat and see if your wife will come with you. We've got a seven-day retreat coming up. So his wife wants to save his mar their marriage, and so she agrees to come, even though she'd probably have other things she'd rather do than meditate for seven days, but <laughs> she comes. And, and so the teacher says, okay, I've got a special place set aside for you in another room, and there's a bed in that room, and I want you two to just spend the next 24 hours in that bed. I don't care if you don't interact in any way. I just, you both need to be on the bed for 24 hours. And so 24 hours go by, there's another interview, and the teacher says, how did it go? And the guy says, well, for 10 hours we didn't speak, and then we started to chat a little bit, and we started to relate a little bit again. And he said, great, go back and do that for 24 hours more. And each day it was like this, until the seven-day retreat was over and their marriage was saved. And what happened? the man came back down to earth. <laughs> and he realized, wow, yeah, we've got something here. There is a connection here. There, this is valid. This is part of the spiritual journey after all. And so there's a temptation that can happen on our spiritual journey where we get so airy, so fairy airy, <laughs> so in the clouds, so transcendent that we forget that we're of no earthly good <laughs> up there. And that's not why we were sent here. So we take that energy and ground it into our lives, and that's where the work is, and that's where the good is shared. So it's really important to stay grounded, to allow ourselves to be connected to the earth. So if you need to lie on the earth or walk barefoot or sit on the earth or connect with the, ele the elements, you know, the fire and the water and the air and the earth, and just garden and put your hands in the earth. All those things will ground you 
and bring you back down and allow you to, of course, have these wonderful spiritual experiences, but allow them to be integrated on your journey. So don't fall victim to the idea that I'm special or separate or superior in some way, that kind of hubris or arrogance. That's the temptation we're talking about here in the second temptation. The third temptation then is um, more about power. So what happens in this one is the devil takes Jesus to a very high mountain. And I just imagine the devil with his arms sort of draped around Jesus, Jesus feeling extra thin and weak. <laughs> and he says, you can have it all, you know? Look at that, look at that kingdom. And there's lights down there and there's probably food and <laughs> all kinds of fabulous things that you could have down there. And you can be the ruler of it all. I mean, you're the king. You got this. You can reign over all this, you know? And so Jesus has been through all this initiation. And, you know, that could be a little tempting, couldn't it? To have that kind of power, to be the king. But he's not buying it. <laughs> he's still staying strong in who he is and his alignment with spirit. And he says, Get behind me, Satan, away with you. We're, I worship the Lord my God and only serve that God. So this is when we, we address that adversarial voice in our minds or that ego, that tempting ego, and we say, get in your rightful place, ego. You are not meant to run the show. You are a helpful servant, but you are meant to serve the Spirit. So get in your place, <laughs> and then you can do your work, you know? So the ego itself can be relieved of this bravado that it's creating, this unnecessary temptation, and that things can once again line up. So the three temptations are that, that temptation to consume, that consumption, that grasping, and that craving kind of temptation. And the, the uh, second temptation, that idea of specialness or hubris. And then this last one is about power, about dominating kind of power, power over, not real spiritual power, power with, collaborative power, but this idea that I, I'm on top or I, I can control. And there are, again, subtle ways this can work in our lives. You might say, oh, I'd never do that. I'm not interested in that. I'm all about teamwork and collaboration. But look more carefully. Because there may be ways that you get a little controlling. Ever want your way? <laughs> Ever do almost anything to get your way? You know, where you can be a little manipulative or uh, a little dominating in different ways. So you just notice those subtleties of how this temptation works. Because really, this is the thing. It's in the subtleties. It's not in these very obvious ways as the... As the the, the mythic story is, is laid out for us, but in these, is in these more subtle ways that we might get into those power struggles for domination in some way, or to be right, or, or to have, have our way. And, and we can get, you know, some of us in, approach this in different ways. It might be in that overpowering way, or it might be in that more backdoor sort of manipulative kind of way. But whatever it is, we can fall privy to that kind of temptation. And so we're being asked to say, no, I serve spirit. And when I serve spirit and I follow the wisdom and the guidance of spirit, the way things show up is quite different, isn't it? Things do tend to work together for good when we are following the path of spirit and the wisdom of our own intuition, rather than taking these tacks of trying to uh, maneuver and make happen a situation that requires this kind of power over or domination. Merriam-Webster defines power as possession of control, authority, or influence over others. And so it's that kind of power that can be tempting when we're offered it. And yet how we might use that power for such good. You know, if we get that it's spiritual power that we have, if you get to be in a position of, um, where you do have influence over people, to use that power in such a way that it's, it's, it's truly spiritual power, it's a power with, that is incredible. And when you are in that kind of space, then you're in that kind of space that is, um, it's humble. 
You know, it's a kind of humility that comes with a spiritual power. You'll, so you'll know the difference from that, that feeling of gratitude and humility versus when we're in the ego, it's more of a feeling of domination and control. And so it's a, a whole different kind of ball game. It's a whole different kind of fuel. The ego's fuel is temporary fuel. You know, it can feel like a powerful spurt, like if you had a moment of being angry and you sort of, you know, dump that anger on somebody, that can feel very powerful in that moment, but it sure doesn't feel very good a few minutes later, does it, when you realize what you've done. And yet, if you can chan rechannel that in a more positive way, it can have a much bigger and, and more um, uh, spiritually effective uh, uh, land for the other person. So it's said in the story that after all of this temptation that the devil then left Jesus and the angels then came to minister unto him. The angels came and waited upon him. And we know metaphysically that angels are divine ideas. So it's like when we face down our temptations, when we say no to them and yes to spirit, we, we are in that sort of angelic realm of divine ideas, of feeling like we're supported and we're guided along the path with a sense of clarity and insight. So just to recap, some of the things that we can do to navigate the temptations is to take our daily bread, right? In that first temptation, that's what Jesus is really saying, the word of God, you know, I take in my daily bread. That's where I get my food. There's another time in the scriptures where the disciples are urging him to eat. And he said, I have food of which you know not. You know, so I'm drawing upon the, the, the food of spirit, the practice, and, that, and that's where I get sustained. So having our practice is sort of that grounding piece, that daily bread that keeps us infilled so we're not so busy reaching out for these other things in life to fill us. And then there's that groundedness that I mentioned, that staying grounded. And so we can be really grounded and then when, a, when an idea arises or an urge arises, we can, in the addiction field, they say, surf the urge. You know, so you can just surf the wave of the urge. I had a friend that was um, quitting smoking, and she said what she realized, and I think she learned this actually um, in research too, that if she surfed the urge to have a cigarette for 30 seconds, it would go away. Now, it might come back again, but then she'd just surf the wave again. And so it's kind of like this idea of giving yourself that space. So allow yourself the space to surf the urge that's up and see if it's still there after you give it your designated amount of time, whether it be 30 seconds or 45 seconds or whatever it may be. And then allow ourselves then to be really grounded to the earth as well so that you know we're, we're using the, the earth itself to be a foundation for us in our spiritual journey when we're feeling a little bit further out, a little bit more in that transcendental kind of realm. To stay true to our intentions, you know, to keep walking toward our intentions, whatever those may be, the goals that we've set for ourselves, to stick to the path, to stick to the journey, to stay uh, committed to our spiritual journey. And to fast from whatever stands in our way, so if it's complaining or criticizing or gossiping, whatever it may be, judging, whatever our tendencies ten are, we fast from those. And that's why this 21-day process is so good because it brings to our conscious mind some of the ways that we're speaking and some of the things that we're putting out there. And so we can catch ourselves and correct it in the moment and form a new habit. That's also a scientific period of time, 21 days scientists say we need to break a habit fully. And then to release just any obstacles to our good, to the power of the word. We talked last week about that release aspect of affirmative prayer. So noticing when there's a temptation and just saying, that temptation has no power over me. I'm not gonna give away my power to that. I'm gonna just surf the urge and allow myself to land back right here where my power is, is set inside of me, in my heart or in my solar plexus or wherever you feel that sense of grounding or sitting upon the earth and feeling it all the more. And then finally, just knowing too that as we grow older, this thing with temptations becomes a little bit easier. 
You know, Winston Churchill said, you don't have to worry about avoiding temptations so much as you grow older because temptation starts avoiding you. <laughs> I guess that's a little bit sad, but true, isn't it? <laughs> so really what we're about is just noticing, right? Paying attention, noticing when the adversary is here, when that little temptation is on your shoulder, you know, whispering in your ear. I love that image of the, the devil and the angel, right? And which one are you going to pay attention to? And so just noticing, noticing what's there, what, what you're being tempted into, and take 30 seconds or so to see, really, which way you want to go with this, whether it be about consumption, or about this idea of hubris or specialness, or the idea of power and control. So we're just about saying no to that, facing down temptations and saying no to that so we can say yes, an absolute resounding yes to spirit. So let's say that together in affirmation form. I say no to temptation and a resounding yes to spirit. So it is. <laughs>